This episode is the collaboration between The Carbon Copy and The Big Switch, a podcast from Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy. We make both of those shows, and they strongly complement each other. So if you like what you hear, go subscribe to The Big Switch wherever you're listening to this show right now. Thanks. From the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. Dr. Melissa Lott has a superpower. Now, I've been on a lot of Zoom calls with her over the past year, and I've seen this in action. She can visualize the energy embodied in everything, a T-shirt, a plane ticket, whatever it is you're eating. I can. It's Is it a superpower? Is it a curse? I think it's really interesting, but I, I can't turn that off. Everywhere I look, even right now, looking around the room I'm in, I can see energy in all the pieces around me. Must be both empowering and mentally taxing. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That's true. When you're when you're eating an ice cream cone with your kid and you're like, oh, you know, the power that it took to actually freeze us and keep it cold and where did this cone come from? I'm sure someday um, my kid is going to go, mom, stop telling me about life cycles. <laughs> like, <laughs> that will happen someday. When COVID fritzed out the economy, Melissa experienced the same things we all did. There were childcare disruptions, travel freeze, just a fear of the unknown. And then she started noticing other visible shifts, shifts with major energy consequences. I remember one day driving through the neighborhood to go pick up groceries because we got a curbside spot, big luck. And in the entire drive to the grocery store until I hit that parking lot, all I saw, no joke, all I saw were delivery vans. So it was Amazon vans, you know, the white big box trucks. Um, and at the time, all those companies were renting out, you know, Hertz and Enterprise, like any van they could get their hands on just to deliver stuff. That's all I saw the entire ride to the grocery store. Now, you didn't need a superpower to see all the delivery trucks suddenly on the roads. They were everywhere. But Melissa could see something else, growing demand for diesel. And, you know, we can see in transportation that, like, diesel demand is really up again. And this is coming from a lot of freight, a lot of trucks on the road, moving goods around, moving all that stuff that we're buying. Experts say it's due to a surge in online ordering during the pandemic. And companies like Amazon adding more trucks for even faster delivery. A recent survey found that nationwide, over the course of 2020, total deliveries rose by almost 28 percent. Groceries in particular jumped by a staggering 103 percent. It wasn't just delivery trucks. For Melissa, every change to our lives meant a change to the energy system. And it raised a question. Would they help or hurt the path to a carbon-free economy? There was so much speculation of, okay, we're all working from home for now. Will this be the big change? And all of a sudden, nobody's commuting anymore. You know, those are the extreme, extreme ones saying that we're not going to have it in offices anymore. No one's going to be getting, you know, commuting to work every day. But then also on the transportation front, were we going to see a continued, you know, low levels of people driving around, low levels of fuel use? Or on the flip side, were we going to see not just a rebound, but a mega rebound where all of a sudden demand shot up because people weren't willing to get on buses and weren't willing to get on, you know, the metro on trains? Two years later, we've got the data. A new report on how emissions from fossil fuels have shifted since the pandemic started. And in some cases, they've roared back faster than expected. To sum it up, one of my colleagues said, well, not surprising, but there we are. (laughs) You know, so now what do we do when it comes to policy as we go into a net zero world? This is The Carbon Copy. I'm Stephen Lacey. This week, we've got a conversation with Dr. Melissa Lott, host of The Big Switch. We'll examine two pandemic-related spikes in fossil fuels, one in transportation and one in electric power. What do they tell us about what has shifted and what hasn't across America's carbon-dependent economy? America's green banks are preparing to unleash a wave of capital for clean energy. The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund invests a historic $27 billion in projects nationwide. This could mobilize up to $150 billion of private capital for solar, storage, efficiency, and electrification in underserved communities. So how do we deploy those billions quickly, efficiently, and with the highest impact? On July 18th, Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure will host a virtual event exploring the -the on-the-ground realities of making America's green banks a success. Register for free by clicking the link in the show notes or go to latitudemedia.com slash events. There we are. So where are we? (laughs) There we are. So overall, you know, what we've seen is that, you know, within each of the different sectors, we have seen some degree of rebound in emissions. 
That's the big headline out of a new report about 2021 emissions. The report is from Rhodium Group, a research and consulting firm. And Rhodium says that carbon pollution bounced back sharply after a big drop off in 2020. I wanted to talk to Melissa because she's one of the people paying close attention to reports like this. She's the director of research at Columbia's Center on Global Energy Policy. She also hosts another podcast that we produce at Postscript called The Big Switch. It's about the big technology and policy changes we need to decarbonize the economy. To self-described energy nerds like Melissa, this rebound was not really a surprise. Once lockdowns lifted and the public started getting vaccines, the general consensus was that economic activity and associated pollution would jump quickly. But the rebound actually wasn't as strong as some thought it would be. And so overall, the the economic recovery has been a little more start and stop than we may have expected with the different variants coming through. On one hand, we've had vaccines. On the other hand, we've had all these variants. And we've seen some of those mixed effects, those starts and stops and unpredictable things happening in different parts of the economy. The surprising thing about 2021 is not that emissions rebounded, but how and where that pollution is coming from. Like how the spike in online shopping drove up demand for delivery vans, which in turn drove up demand for diesel. So transportation had decreased overall by, I think it was 15% um, from 2019 to 2020. And we've seen it come back by 10%. And a lot of that is driven, you know, by actually a lot of freight and a lot of diesel use. So aviation's still down, but you know what? We're buying a lot of stuff and it's moving around on the roads. Conversely, like if you look at industry and power and buildings, you're seeing things coming back to different degrees. So, you know, industry dropped by about 6% and now it's back, not quite 4%. So it's, it's you know, two thirds of the way, not quite, a little bit less than that back. Electric power, you know, we have seen people going back into the offices. We have seen some shifts in terms of power demand. So that's back up overall, you know, it went down 10% and it's back up six and a half percent. So, you know, this is what we're seeing across the economy. Some of the stuff is what we predicted would happen. So it's people getting back in their cars and people buying a lot of stuff and people staying out of the air right now. But I don't think we're exactly where we thought we would be in 2021 going into 2022. So in the transportation sector, where did we think we would be and how does that compare with where we are? So overall in the transportation sector, you know, this is where we saw the largest increase in emissions in 2021, according to this preliminary data from Rhodium Group. And, you know, what this is reflecting is actually this high demand for freight transport. So for trucks on the road to move around goods that we're buying. Overall, I think what is surprising to some, maybe surprising to a lot of people, is that if you look at gasoline demand for passenger transport, it's actually been pretty flat, So some people were saying, oh, it's going to shoot rocket up as people go back to the office, but they won't get on the metro or they won't get on buses. So they're going to be using their cars. So we're going to see gasoline go way up. Other people were saying, no, everyone's going to stay home. So it's going to go way down. Actually, it stayed flat. (laughs) Like that was a little bit surprising to a lot of people. Um, Overall, jet fuel is still way down. And I don't think that surprises too many people that we still aren't flying like we used to. Transportation is important because the changes to how we work, how we go to school, how we buy things, change the way we get around. That caused a rise in diesel, a stagnation in gasoline, and a precipitous drop in jet fuel. Those are some of the major trends we saw out of 2021. But what I wanted to know from Melissa was, which of these trends is going to last? So long term, what do we expect to stick? And what do we expect to be a passing trend in the transportation sector? So I think in the short term, you know, we do expect people to be going back to work more than they were before. We do expect people to continue buying things. Um, And there's a lot of interesting research starting to come out about how sticky we think our changes in buying trends are going to be. And it seems like they'd be pretty sticky. So the, in the longer term, I think what's really interesting to follow is the major changes we're seeing in passenger transport around electric vehicles and electrification of vehicles. We really are seeing momentum there and a lot of states stepping up and creating coalitions saying we're going to build up the infrastructure to make this a long lasting trend. But also in heavy duty trucking, I think some of the most interesting stuff we're seeing is around regulations to reduce air pollution from these trucks. So I'm thinking about in California, all the stuff they're doing around smog check regulations to actually make sure that as we have these trucks on the road, that actually we don't just see an endless increase in air pollution. And so that's a long-term trend. I don't see that going backwards. 
But there was another trend reversed by the pandemic, at least for the short term, the steady decline in coal. After the break, why is coal rebounding? And what does it tell us about our reliance on fossil gas? On July 18th, join Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure as we take a deep dive into the next phase of deploying the $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. We'll provide practical insights for the state agencies and local lenders at the front lines of dispensing these funds. Where are the bottlenecks? How do we balance speed with transparency? And can America's green banks live up to the expectations of both local communities and Wall Street? Latitude Media's Stephen Lacey, Banyan co-founder Amanda Lee, and Clean Energy Fund of Texas EVP Billy Briscoe will answer these questions and more on July 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. This is a must-attend for project developers and financiers. Register for free at latitudemedia.com slash events or click the link in the show notes. For a long time, coal was king in America. It's been the dominant source of fuel for electricity since the middle of the 20th century. But starting in 2007, it declined steadily. Fifteen years ago, coal made up half of the electricity produced in the U.S. In 2020, it fell to 19 percent. But in 2021, coal use increased by double digits, even though demand for power increased by only a few percentage points. This shift in favor of coal may not last very long, but it does tell us something about how hard the transition away from fossil fuels will be, even with extremely cheap wind and solar. Yeah, so this is really fascinating on a lot of levels. So overall, we saw an electric power, which is something like just under 30%, so not quite a third of U.S. emissions. We saw the second largest increase behind transportation in terms of greenhouse gases, and it was driven by coal. So what happened with coal over the last decade? So we look at overall at electric power. And this is where coal plays a big role in the economy. What we saw is that cheap natural gas and cheap renewables came in strong. And they said, you know what, we are actually going to displace a lot of coal in the system. Coal is no longer going to be this, you know, cheap leader in terms of supplying electricity. Cheap natural gas and cheap renewables, in particular wind and solar, are going to come in and replace it. And so we saw coal have a declining role overall. And so most people thought this trend would continue because renewables are only getting cheaper. Natural gas prices have stayed low, but there are still a lot of coal plants just sitting there on the electric grid. So those coal plants ramp back up when you see high natural gas prices. Is that what happened? It's what happened in a lot of cases. So in some parts of the country, coal is still competitive a lot of the time, or at least competitive enough that you don't shut down the plant. It just runs less of the time. It's producing less electricity. And so when natural gas got more expensive, coal said, hey, I'm cheaper. Let, you know, let me back in, coach. And all of a sudden it was running more than it had before, more than it had in a number of years. And so we saw emissions go up with that. The consensus has been that coal is dying or is basically dead in the American electric sector. But this tells us that 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 is not true. It tells us it's not true. It also highlights how different parts of the countries have different markets where coal is more or less competitive. So there's some parts of the country, I'm thinking about some pockets in the West, where actually coal still makes it in the market. It's still competitive. It's still alive. This highlights an uncomfortable reality for America. Fossil gas has been the biggest factor in the decline of coal, even though renewables are booming. Our economy's relationship with fossil gas is key to understanding what happened with coal this year. So help us understand this, because wind and solar are the cheapest new resources that you can develop. And if they're so cheap and getting cheaper and cheaper, why can't you just use them to close down all these coal plants faster? Why do we see this spike? So you still have a bunch of coal baked into the system, as well as other technologies, because at the end of the day, wind and solar are great, but they're not around all the time. They're not able to produce electricity 24-7, 365. They do a great job, but there's still gaps, and those gaps can be bigger or smaller in different parts of the country during different times of the year. And the reality is we need to keep the lights on every day, all day. And so what you end up with is to keep prices low on your electricity bills, you end up with a mix of things. You have your wind and your solar, but you also need what we call dispatchable power or firm power. So stuff that just is can be turned on any time of the day or night. And that's where coal comes in. And that's where natural gas comes in. Is this coal comeback short term or long term? How do you read it? Whether this coal comeback is short or long term, I think depends a lot on what decisions we make in policy in the near term. 
there are so many states and cities that are saying we're going to move to net zero electricity. We're going to move to zero emissions. So in that equation, coal has a real tough spot. So I can't see coal roaring back to its glory days of a few decades ago. I don't think anyone sees that. I personally think it'll be shorter term. As you're reading this analysis from Rhodium Group, what's going through your mind about this transition? Just how far we have to go and how little time we actually have to get there. At the beginning of all this, at the beginning of COVID and when emissions were dropping, the number one thing that we all kept saying was the infrastructure has to change or else all these emissions are just going to come roaring back and that's not going to work. So when I look at these big drops, I just think about how fast we need to move our infrastructure to net zero if we want to keep emissions down. There's just so far to go. This pandemic has exposed so many flaws across our economy, in our political systems, and problems that were already there have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Does this expose any particular flaws in the energy transition or the energy system that we knew were there but are now staring us in the face? In the energy transition, it shows us how much prices matter when we look at these numbers, to me at least, because I think about the one in three Americans that are currently energy insecure in this country right now. They either can't pay their bills or they're not turning on their air conditioning or heating and making their home healthy to be in because they know they can't pay the bill if they do turn it on. Um, And when we go through this transition, we have to keep it affordable. We have to keep the cost down or those numbers are just gonna get worse and those gaps are just gonna get worse. At the same time, we have this tension where the air pollution from these coal plants and the air pollution from these diesel trucks, they don't affect us all the same. Like air pollution is something that affects all of us, but certain communities, those near ports, those near these big shipping distribution centers, you know, where all the trucks come in, like they feel it more. The air pollution is worse in these areas. And so really we have to grapple with these equity questions in the transition around affordability and around these health impacts. What does this tell us about the unpredictability of that pathway to getting to zero? I think it's tempting to look at these lines of emissions on graphs that we see all over the place and it's so smooth. You know, it seems like such a smooth transition if we put our minds to it. The reality is the transition is going to be bumpy. It's going to be full of starts and stops. It's something that is happening in the middle of all of, all of our lives. And so we should expect those bumps. And those bumps don't mean we're not going to get to net zero. They just mean that that smooth path isn't the reality we're going to live as we get there. Dr. Melissa Lott is the Director of Research at Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy. She's also host of another Postscript podcast called The Big Switch. We make that in collaboration with Columbia. It breaks down the economy part by part and explains how we can remove carbon emissions from each piece. If you haven't already, go check out their other episodes. You can find them wherever you're listening to this show. And what you should also know is that the pandemic turned Melissa into a chef with exquisite taste. Like everyone started cooking from home and like baking sourdough bread and all that stuff. I never got into the sourdough, but I did a lot of other things. You know, I learned how to make flan. I don't know, just a lot of cooking at home. It's my favorite kind of sweet. Flan? Really? Yeah. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, one of my top. It's really delicious. The Carbon Copy is a co-production of Postscript Media and Canary Media. Our producers are Jamie Kaiser, Daniel Waldorf, Dalvin Abuaje, and Alexandria Herr. Sean Marquand mixed the episode and composed our theme. Original music came from Echo Finch and Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks to Canary for their partnership. Thanks to all of you for listening. And make sure to listen to our companion podcast, Catalyst, with Shale Khan. Find it at Canary Media or any podcast app. You got a lot of listening ahead of you. Join us here next week. I'm Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy.